Good morning. Good morning, everybody, and for myself, happy Mother's Day. Yeah, thank you, and to my precious wife. Wonderful. The wife of my youth. Thank you. I feel like I'm a needy person with all this happening around me, but anyway. I am here. Okay, thanks. Well, good morning to all of you. It's wonderful to see you. I uh, have the privilege of bringing the word today, and uh, we have a little bit of time, not a lot, but that's fine. Um, I trust you all well. I trust you have a good Mother's Day. And um, two weeks ago, I was in Denver. I had the privilege of being in Denver, a, s- a little suburb called Westminster. I uh, did some ministry on Friday and Saturday, and Sunday and Saturday. Um, whew, the presence of God just came into that place. It was amazing. It really was amazing. Uh, we did quite a bit of praying for people, and when we came to the end, it was about already 1.30. It's like God just came in a different way. It was, um, yeah, it was amazing. Nobody moved for quite a while, so it's just that tangible presence of God. And I share that to tell you things are happening. There's some wonderful things happening, wonderful things happening in the kingdom. Anyway, um, I have this morning, about two or three weeks ago, Dwayne preached on the head and the body. I don't know if you were here, and uh, he gave a little stick figure. I don't know if they can bring it up about the head and the body, and the body needs to be part of the head, and the head needs to be part of And then he gave another one about, the, oh, that one, that one, that one. And so I'll just read from Colossians 1, 17, 18. It says, He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. The New Living Translation puts Christ as the head of the church, which is the body. So I remember that drawing, and I asked myself while he was preaching, what facilitates keeping the body connected to the head? What facilitates that? Because we need to be, we are his body, but he's the head. He calls the shots in a sense. So we want to stay connected. So if you carry on reading, if you've got your Bible, go to Colossians, please. Colossians, and I know they've been doing a series in Colossians, which I think I've missed probably 70% of it just because of the traveling. So, <coughs> But I heard it's been outstanding. And Colossians actually gives us the answer. So if you read from verse 18, it says, He's the head of the body of the church. I'm reading from the uh, NIV. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and you were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, a better translation as shown by your evil behavior. It's just an outworking of what's happening inside. But now he's reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. And he has the answer to the question I asked. If you continue in your faith, established and firm not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. The New Traveling Translation puts it this way, but you have, uh, sorry, but you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Some have drifted from the assurance that you received when you heard the good news. So it's faith. It's faith and faith alone. It's not by our good works. It's faith, our trust and belief in who he is and what he's done and what he said he's doing. And so faith keeps us connected, and that's what I want to touch a little bit on today, just the aspect of faith. It's a huge aspect in the Word, but the Bible makes it very, 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 very clear that every provision that was won at Calvary, every provision that was won through his death, resurrection, and ascension, every blessing, every provision, everything that was provided for us comes to us via faith. Everything we need to appropriate that is done. His abundant grace and mercy are made available to us on the basis of faith and faith alone. Hebrews 11, 6 puts it this way, and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe, first of all, that he exists 
And secondly, that he rewards those who earnestly or diligently seek him. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Now, people can take that negatively, but that's not what it's saying. It's actually encouraging us that as we believe in him, we please him. We please him. No matter what we do, no matter how good our motives, no matter how sincere or zealous we are, without faith, it's impossible to please God. My first sermon I ever did, oof, feels like 100 years ago. <laughs> it was close. Acquaintance <laughs> is close. It was actually just before I got saved, funny enough. The guy asked me to preach. But I didn't know then, I know now, God had called me and he was heading me towards an encounter with him. And I read a book by Billy Graham and I literally took part of what he said and put it on paper and that's what my first sermon was and it was on faith because that's what gripped my heart. It took me nine and a half minutes and I was done. And I didn't know what to do afterwards. <laughs> I had no clue what to do. I finished my notes and I said, hmm, we're done. Okay, all right. <laughs> So because of that, because of the, the, the incredible um, importance of faith, the enemy will do whatever he can, whatever he can to move you, to move us from a position of faith or a state of, pla a state of faith or a place of faith. He will do whatever he can to move us away from that. He really will. He'll get us to look somewhere else. He'll get us to look at our own inadequacies. We'll get us to look at our faults. He'll even get us to look at our strengths, which um, can be a huge, huge, huge key. He'll get us to look wherever he wants us to look. But the Bible says, fix your eyes on Jesus in Hebrews, the author and the perfecter of your faith. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. So even in Abram's day, when Abram and Lot were disagreeing and they needed to part, and Abram said, you pick the little soil you want, and I'll pick, and then whatever you, I'll go somewhere else. And Abram looked, and I mean, Lot looked, and he saw this beautiful, fertile valley, so he said, that's what I'll take. And then the Lord comes to Abram and says, look, north, east, south, west. Don't look at a little piece of property. I want to extend your vision, and I want you to understand that I'm the one that's going to give you all this ground. Wherever, whatever you look at. So it's interesting, he told him to look, look. Look, and the devil will get us to look elsewhere, and the Lord will keep saying, no, look at me, look at me. And even in Genesis 15, when, he's talk when Abram's talking to God and says, well, you promised me a son, but things are not quite happening. Is my servant going to be one? And the Lord said to Abram, come outside, look up. And as he looked up and he saw the stars, and as he counted the stars, something shifted inside him. And the Bible said he believed, and it was come to do as righteous. That's why he's the father of faith. It's key where we look. Absolutely vital where we look. Because what we behold, that's what takes up our heart and our time, and that's what we become. So be careful where you look. I'm encouraging you. So even in Acts chapter 3, when uh, John and Peter were on their way to a prayer, Remember the man at the gate, beautiful? They approached him and they said, look at us. Take your eyes off yourself and look at us. What I have, I give unto you. Stand up and walk. This is what the Bible says about faith. We've got to live by faith, not sight. There's a difference between faith and hope. I'm going to touch on that briefly. There's a gift of faith. There's faith as a fruit. The righteous will live by faith. The Bible teaches our faith comes Faith must be confessed. We're going to touch on that a bit. Faith must be worked out. Faith will be tested. Will be tested. <laughs> That's the good news. And the Bible says, fight the good fight of faith. It's literally the only fight we fight. Fight the good fight of faith. It's because it's like a, a tug and war. It's like, yes, I believe. Oh, I'm not sure. Yes. It's that fight of faith. And Paul says in 1 Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession, when you made your good confession. So there's that fight. And it's interesting, the Bible says in uh, Ephesians 6, it's the shield of faith that distinguishes the flaming arrows of the evil one. That's what faith does. And so there's a list. Uh, I got a list here somewhere. 
that I just took it out of the Bible. I just looked at what faith does. This is what faith does. This is what the Bible says. I think some of you have heard me. People are healed by faith. People are delivered by faith. People are forgiven by faith. People are encouraged by faith. People are made righteous by faith. People are justified by faith. People are sanctified by faith. People are offered sacrifice because of their faith. People moved cities because of their faith. Children were conceived by faith. Their future was blessed by faith. They persevered by faith. They worshiped because of their faith. They denied the pleasures of sin because of their faith. Faith pleased God. The waters were parted by faith. The walls fell by faith. The kingdoms were conquered by faith. Battles were won by faith. Justice was administrated by faith. Lines were quieted by faith. The dead were raised by faith. They walked through the fire by faith and miracles were performed by faith. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I just literally to get out of the Word of God, particularly out of Hebrews. So faith is important. It's important to the eyes of the Lord. We have five physical senses, which, which we engage the physical world. Faith is heaven's currency and opens up the spirit realm to us. It is a spiritual sense that enables us to touch the spirit realm, to taste of the spirit realm, to see things of the spirit realm, to hear things of the spirit realm. Like our five senses connect here, yeah? our faith helps us connect to the unseen realm. Who's God? And his word, which I cannot see with my natural eyes. That's what it helps. That's what it helps it connects with. Hebrews 11 says, faith was the ingredient that caused, prompted, stirred uh, these people to see and embrace and experience supernatural things. To stand strong in the face of opposition. To stand strong of immense hardships, severe suffering and ridicule. And enable them to participate patiently and pres persevere patiently as they awaited the fulfillment of the promise. It was faith that did that. It was faith. So Hebrews 11.1, 1, if you've got a Bible, go there. You all, most of you know the scripture. <coughs> it's the one word the Bible helps us understand. <coughs> you all still with me? Yeah. All right. Oh, thanks, Dwayne. I heard yours voice. <laughs> All right, Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now, faith is being sure of, or the substance of what we hope for, and certain of what we do not see. Faith is being sure of, or the substance of what we hope for. So, hope plays a part. And certain, or the evidence of the conviction of what we do not see. So, this verse mentions faith and hope. It's helpful to understand the difference. The first main difference is that faith has to do with the heart, while well, hope has to do with the mind. Hope is the climate in which faith begins to be cultivated and work. That's what hope does. Hope is a joyful, confident expectation of good from God. But it's not faith yet. But it needs, faith needs to start there. That's how it begins to cultivate. I'm expecting God's goodness. I'm trusting in His goodness. I'm looking to Him because He's a good God. You with me? Hope is God's appointed protection for our minds. That's why it says put on the helmet of salvation. Yeah. This is the Passion's translation of that verse. Now, faith brings our hopes into reality and becomes the foundation needed to acquire the things we long for. It is the evidence required to prove what is still unseen. So faith is the substance of what we hope for. But it starts with hope. It's a cultivating ground. It's very key. Never lose hope. I encourage you, wherever you lost hope in an area in your life, you believe the lie. Because the devil will try and rob that away. So he'll come to you in an area of your life and we lose hope in some areas. And I'm encouraging you, go back to the Lord and say, Lord, put hope back within me in this area of my life, whatever it may be or whatever it's to do with or whatever the case is. We need it. So how does faith come? Good question. How does faith arise within me? <laughs> Romans 10, 17 gives us the answer. And you can turn there if you want to, but I'll read it. So faith comes by hearing, you all know the answer, and hearing by the word of God. And that word or the word of Christ, that word of word is rhema, which I'm going to explain now. NIV puts it this way. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of of Christ. That in the NIV it says living voice. It's the living voice. So faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. So there's three stages in faith coming. Number one, God's word. Number two, hearing. And then faith comes. 
So God's word does not immediately produce faith in me, but it produces a hearing. And that word hearing is key. It's, 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 a, it's an attitude of aroused intent and attention. It's a, seared, a sincere desire to receive and understand. I remember just before I got th- saved, um, all of a sudden, I, I, we, I said to Michelle, we need to go to this wherever we needed to go on a family retreat. And when I went there, the guy that was preaching was the first time I actually listened. I heard what he had to say. There was an interest in me to, okay, let me hear what he's got to say. Whereas before, sometimes I preached, it didn't interest me at all. My mind was on the football or this or that or whatever, or what I'm going to do. But now all of a sudden, it was this hearing. There was an attitude. There was an aroused interest. And, an at, and I gave it some attention, a sincere desire to receive and understand what this person was saying. Then out of hearing, faith develops. So sometimes it can take a while. Sometimes it's, you need a little bit of patience. And then out of, so hearing is God's word. It starts a process in me by which faith develops over a period of time. Faith doesn't come so much by praying for it. Faith comes by reading the word. You can pray all I like for faith, but the Bible says faith comes by hearing. So I say, I try to make it practical. This, this, and this are the avenues of faith. This, this, and this. That physical elements that God has given us to arouse something in my heart so faith can arise and I continue to put my hope in this great creator and faith can begin to arise in me. So faith always attaches itself to what God has said, promised, or revealed. Always, that's what it attaches itself to. It grows and develops out of the word, and you can't believe beyond the knowledge of what the word says. Otherwise, we're going to get skewed. Faith takes us beyond the visible to the invisible, to the unseen realm, and is based upon the eternal truths and the realities of God and his word, his nature and his character. That's what it does. And there's an inward witness that begins to slowly arise within me, a confidence that grows and establishes when the word prevails over my thinking. Because there's hope, yeah, and the word prevails, and I'm reading the word, and hope's arising in my mind, and as I'm thinking on it, as I focus on it, there's a time where that's going to drop, yeah, and then faith's going to come. Amen. Thank you. Okay. Faith is response, let me say this, of a human being to the initiative that God takes in making himself known. So God starts the process. God speaks. God reveals. God shows us something. So it starts with God. It doesn't start with me. Faith is hearing the word of Christ. So he's got to speak. It's the living word. He's got to show me something. So he initiates it. Then he waits for us to take hold of it to process it and get it internally inside of us and it's established in us. And then we respond out of faith to him and then God responds. And I know that's a process. It can sometimes take a while, but that's how it works. So God always initiates. He came and revealed himself to Abram. He came and revealed himself to Isaac. He came and revealed himself to Jacob. Not because he had revealed himself to, 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 uh, to his grandfather, his father. He had to personally reveal himself to the son and the grandson. And say, well, well, actually what I told your dad or your granddad, let me repeat it to you. This is me telling you now. You heard it from him, but now let me tell you. Hello, you with me? That's how faith arises. That's how faith arises. And then it takes a while for it to get inside of it really, really, really deep down inside of us. Allow me to explain it this way. This is God's eternal word, unchanging, logos forever. Never change, the Bible says, Psalm 119. This is the logos, forever sealed in heaven. Amen, it's not gonna change. Then rhema comes, the word rhema literally means to speak. Rhema comes, is spoken from this eternal word in a time and a space 
what, are you, what day are we? Sunday, what's the date? May 12th, thank you. Oh, Mother's Day, hallelujah. Thank you, now remember. So God comes, he takes from his eternal word that's been there forever, and he takes a portion of it, a section of it, or a part of it, and then he brings it and he speaks it into day and time and now to us. That's what he does. He speaks, that's what rhema means. He, rhema comes to each of us directly. It's not all the same at the same time. So a rhema word for my wife will be different for me at a different time, in a different phase, in a different area of my life. And so that's how it comes. God speaks into or reveals it or shows us or whatever the case is. But it's something to always, always go back to the Logos. Always. That's why it's good to get this and know it because what we put inside, you take something that you know and you're beginning to quote and then all of a sudden you'll make it alive inside of you. And it captures your attention with it. And then you get it inside of you. And I spoke on how to meditate with the Word of God, how to really get that inside of you and dig it deep inside of you. So Derek Prince puts it this way. The life of continuous dependency upon God's reign is clearly set forth in the words in which Jesus answered Satan's first temptation in the wilderness. Jesus said, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word, rhema, that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's what Jesus said. The word proceeds is in the continuous presence tense. We could say every word as it proceeds out of the mouth of God. Jesus yes speaks of a specific word proceeding directly from God's mouth, a word energized by the breath of his mouth. And the Bible says, if you read, I think it's Psalm 33, where he said he created the heavens, he breathed the breath of his mouth, and the heavens were created. Let there be. And as we live continuously dependent upon it, this word, it imparts to us day by day the faith by which we alone, the righteous man, will live by. So, he put it this way. Let's sum it up, the relation between the Logos and the Rhema in the following statements. Rhema takes the eternal Logos and injects it into time. Rhema takes the heavenly Logos and brings it down to earth. Rhema takes the potential Logos and makes it actual. Rhema takes the general Logos and makes it specific. Rhema takes a portion of the total Logos and puts it in a form that I can understand in today's time, in the 20th, 21st century. That's the goodness of God. Isaiah 55. You got a Bible? Isaiah 55. Um, what would cause, and I don't know how to say this without you looking at me, what would cause a 49-year-old man and his wife to come from a nation that he was born in and come to this wonderful nation? Because God spoke. I believed it. And so we started to make arrangements on what we believe God said. We hand her over church and we hadn't got our visa yet. So if the visa didn't come, I don't know what I was going to do because we'd already handed the church over. But it was tested. Trust me, it was tested a couple of times. <laughs> was tested by the grace of God, he held us stand strong. Uh, what did I say? Isaiah. Well, how do you pronounce it here? Yeah? Isaiah. As I said, one day we will ask him. All right. <laughs> one day we'll ask. We'll all gather together and call him. Hey, Isaiah, Isaiah, why don't you come here? <laughs> how do you pronounce your name and you'll fool us all? <laughs> all right, let's go to verse 8. 55 verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As high as the heavens, sorry, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts and your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering it, watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it heals seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word that goes from my mouth. It will not return to me void or empty, but accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. 
So very simply put, we have two realms here. We have the heavenly realm and we have the earthly realm. And on the heavenly realm is the divine logos of God, his ways and his thoughts, the total counsel of God settled forever and ever. But on the earthly level, we have man's ways and thoughts far below those of God and actually incomparable to him, as he says in his word. There's no way by which man can rise up to God's level, but there is a way in which God comes down and speaks to us where we're at. And he speaks his thoughts and his ideas, and then he uses a symbol like the rain that comes down from heaven to cause this earth to be watered and bud and flourish and produce. So is the word that will come out of my mouth. When you receive it, it will cause you to bud and flourish and fruit will begin to come. Fruit that will give glory to my Father. Fruit that will last, Jesus said in John 15. Fruit, uh, he calls it abundant of fruit, and more fruit. There's four times he mentions fruit in John 15. You'll be fruitful. You'll be more than fruitful. And this will bring glory to my Father. When we are fruitful, it brings glory to the Father in heaven because of his word that has come out from heaven. So I use a simple example, and I'm sorry, I don't know how else to do this because I want you to picture it in your mind. So it's like God comes from his eternal logos, the incredible word of God, and he takes a portion of it, and, it's, and it pulsates with power, choo, choo, and it comes down from heaven. Now you won't forget this, choo, pulsating, pulsating, pulsating. Got God DNA, God's ability, God's power, God's grace, God's love, God's everything, everything it needs. It's got God's in it. And then he wants to put it here. That's how faith arises. Not me doing it. Just me believing it. Hallelujah. Don't have to try hard. Just believe. <laughs> Just believe. So, let me touch on this one more thing. Praise the living Lord. Okay. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 3, please, if you don't mind. I want to talk a little bit about confession because it's so important. Hebrews 3. Hebrews chapter 3, and then I want to share a testimony. So one of the major themes in the book of Hebrews is the high priesthood of Jesus Christ. It's a major theme that runs through the book of Hebrews, plus another couple of themes. So in Hebrews 3, Hebrews 4, Hebrews 5, Hebrews 8, Hebrews 10, and Hebrews 7 and 10. It's all about the high priesthood of Jesus Christ. So in Hebrews 3, verse 1, it says, Therefore, holy brothers who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, the apostle and high priest, whom we confess. So, first of all, it says, Jesus, the apostle. That word apostle means messenger or sent one. So God sent Jesus to represent God the Father. He's the exact image of God the Father. So he sent him to this earth to represent all he is and everything about him. He was the sent one. He's our po uh, high apostle. But then the Bible says he's also the high priest whom we confess. And the high priest in his capacity as high priest is now for us towards God. So he came from God to reveal God to us. Now as a high priest, he comes to us to help us understand the Lord. So he comes from our behalf, if you understand what I'm saying. He's the people's representative now to God the Father. He was God's Father to the people, now he's people's representative. That's what a high priest does. So in his capacity, Jesus ministers as our personal representative in the presence of God the Father, because that's where he's seated. He covers us with his righteousness. He offers up our prayers. He presents our needs to the Father. He becomes the guarantee, the Bible says in Hebrews, the guarantee of a fulfillment of God's promises on our behalf. It becomes a guarantee. Hebrews 7 tells us that. Because of the oath that God took on behalf of Jesus, you'll be, all, um, uh, you'll be a high priest in forever in the order of Melchizedek. I take an oath that, that I'll never change my mind, the Lord says. You'll always be the high priest for the people unto me. Very important to understand that. So, but in his high priestness is linked to our confession. Read it. And the apostle and high priest whom we confess. 
So the confession we make on earth determines the extent to which Jesus is free to exercise his priestly ministry on our behalf in heaven. It is our confession that makes the heavenly, um, the heavenly, I can't, can't read my words yet, sorry, <laughs> the heavenly priesthood effective for us on earth. It's our confession that makes his priesthood effective in heaven for us on earth. Each time we make the right confession, we have the full authority of Christ as a high priest. If we, if we confess doubt or unbelief, that's why it's the wrestle, rather than faith, it's like we give Christ a little opportunity to be who he's called to be, the high priest. We tie his hands. Right confession opens up the heavenlies. Wrong confession shuts them off. That's how important what comes out of your mouth. Hebrews 4. Let's turn there. Hebrews 4, 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly or let us hold fast the faith we profess. Hold firmly. Hold fast. Don't go back. Don't think back. Hold fast to the profession of who he is, who Christ is in your life. Hold fast to it. And many pressures will come. The, as the testimony said, the devil will attack you. I'm telling you he will. He will try and bring doubt to your mind. But the Bible is in Hold fast to that profession. Hold fast to it. Just whatever you professed when you first came to know, hold it fast. Don't let it go. Because he will do what only the high priest can do on our behalf. So all I've got to do is hold fast my confession. And Jesus is at work on my behalf. By our faith and confession, we continue to hold on to these things. We do not change in the word of God. And if you go to Hebrews chapter 10, you'll see it again. Hebrews 10, verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Christ, by a new and living way, opened up through the curtain, that is his body. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God. God sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty cause, having our bodies washed, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good. Let us not give up meeting together. Let us encourage one another as it's still day. So again, in, in Hebrews chapter 10, it says, because of what we profess, hold on unswervingly. So first of all, hold on to what you profess, Hebrews 3. Hebrews 4, hold on firmly to what you profess. Hebrews 10 is, hold on unswervingly to what you profess. You see how it grows, how it gets established in us. Why? Because he is faithful. He is faithful. He will do it. He is faithful. He is faithful. He is faithful. I'm unfaithful. He is faithful. Thank the Lord for that. He is faithful. He's faithful. He's faithful. He's faithful. He will do it. He will do it. He will do it. That's what he will do. So I encourage, hold on to the things that God has revealed to you. Speak them. Declare them. Say them. Fight that good fight of faith. It is a fight. I understand that. I don't... I want to read a testimony to you if I can find it amongst my notes here. I'm not organized like other people are. It's here somewhere. Trust me, it's here. Okay. I thought I had it, yeah? It's a wonderful testimony. Okay. Let's see, it's hiding. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> we had the privilege of going to um, uh, Vancouver. Well, we go to Vancouver quite a bit. I actually leave, Michelle and I leave on Wednesday to go to Vancouver for uh, 10 days. Um, and we go to a particular church. We've got a number of churches. We're very privileged. But there's one particular church we've been to a couple of times, and it's like 
God has just taken this church on from one degree of glory to the next, if I can put it that way. Anyway, a couple of years ago, I might have shared with some of you, I shared it on Tuesday at the meeting, so I thought, let me share it again. We did a whole weekend on spiritual warfare, and on the Saturday afternoon, we had some ministry, and there was a 15-year-old young girl sitting in the front with her mom. And uh, I didn't know what the, she, 15 years old, she was 15 years old, sorry, 15 years old, she was sitting next to her mom. Um, I didn't know she was 15, I now know because of the testimony she gave. And, um, but I could just see her sitting next to her mom, and she sat there through th- th- uh, Friday night, she sat there through Saturday, and then when it came for the time of ministry, um, from what I remember, I'll tell you, but then she says what she remembers and what actually happened. And um, uh, a lot of stuff was beginning to happen, and I walked across the front row, and I was just praying for people as I felt led to pray. And I came to her, and I literally just put my hand on her shoulder, and I just, I don't know what the issue was. I had no clue. She hadn't seen it. I just said, Lord, touch this young lady. Please bless her. And then I moved on, and then I came back to her, and I prayed for her again similar thing, and then as I was moving, the mother grabbed my arm, she grabbed me, and she said, yeah, and she put these things in my hand, I don't know what they were, they were two little things in my hand, she said, my daughter's healed, so I said, oh, (laughs) but by that time, there was like electricity in the room, this is a testimony, and I want you to notice what you went through for many years, but you never lost hope. That's what I want you to notice, because hope was the greed and bound for faith. When I was 15 years old, I became ill. It was a combination of chronic virus, chronic excruciating pain, and hyperacusis. What that is, is when sound enters your ears, it is causing excruciating pain to go right through your body. So they had to walk with tiptoes in the house, they had to, everything had to be quiet. She was never allowed out the house because of the pain, the excruciating pain that went through her body. It's called hypocosis. Extreme pain, yeah, the pods in the ear that she pulled out was to stop the sound. That's what the pods were in for. Extreme pain that comes with sound. I was sick for three years. My life was ripped away from me. I lost all, all my friends. I could no longer attend school and could not participate in my great passion, Irish dancing. The thing about excruciating pain, that is it travels all to all parts of your body, so that while it was in my auditory nerves that were shredded, my entire body was in intense pain. My headaches were bad enough that at first the doctors thought I had a brain tumor or a brain bleed. Sometimes the pain was so bad I could barely breathe. Sometimes it was so bad I couldn't move. It was as if I was paralyzed. Sometimes I truly thought I was about to die, but I was never suicidal. But when the pain was at the level, at that level, although I did not want to die, I needed to go to heaven and be with Jesus and to be free from the suffering. The illness and the pain would last for three days, for three years. The first one and a half years I could barely remember as the pain had wiped my memory, which I think was a mercy from God. For two and a half years, I was too ill to even leave the house. The last six months were some of the, some improvements, but I was still very frail and a constant pain with numerous bad relapses when I could not get out of bed. The pain was centered in my ears. We think I was attacked there, so I would not be able to hear God's words. However, the remarkable thing happened about three years after, sorry, however, the remarkable thing about these three years that I I never, never once felt angry or bitter or depressed or hopeless. And now she did it. A few times I felt sad, but immediately I arrived at my compass and looked to God, and the sadness went away. Only lost in a few seconds. None of my many doctors and non Christian friends could believe this. They were shocked. I was not depressed and was so full of peace, hope, and even joy. Everyone who walked into my house and said immediately they felt peace. For the entire three years, I only felt, sorry, the entire three years, I felt an all-encompassing peace. God protected my heart in a way I don't know was possible. My family and doctors tried so many medications and therapies, and nothing really helped. Yet instead of despair, I, I felt strongly that there was an important purpose for all this, and even a whisper of not yet, 
Looking back on my journal entries, some which were written when I was in extreme pain and could hardly breathe, the phrase that repeated itself again and again, my heart feels as if it's a sorry, I thank you, God. My faith was a bright, shining light that could not be dimmed. This was truly a gift from God. This summer, I felt a shift in my heart. I had a picture of a large red ball that was at the top of a hill starting to roll. It was going faster and faster, and I knew it would get, get to a speed when nothing could stop it. God told me he was about to bring my healing. God also told me, <coughs> sorry, that he had great things, powerful things, wonderful things would happen this year. The final conviction I had was that this would be the year of healing. Nearly, nearly exactly three years after I became ill, my church had a weekend conference led by King Gwentlaw. It was only the second time I was physically well enough to go to church. <clears throat> Saturday was my third time at church, and it was a miracle. I was able to stay the whole day because as normally I had no stamina. But I prayed to God for strength, and I knew he wanted me there, so I stayed there with little problem of being tired. During the worship, we sang a song, Take Courage. There's a line that goes, hold on to your hope <laughs> as your triumph unfolds. As soon as I saw the word triumph, I knew that was for me from God. The entire time I was ill, I had been calling it a trial. Yet I said I was so thankful for because of how I grew closer to God, but I knew that it was a triumph, not a trial. It had been a triumph from the second I became ill. On Saturday afternoon, there was a ministry session. As soon as I walked in, I felt a tenseness in my shoulders, and I could not loosen my stomach, was churning. When it was time for prayer, I was the third person that Ken prayed for. I was shaking and sobbing with the power of the Holy Spirit. Ken made me look in his eyes. I don't remember that part. I'm just being honest. And I desperately wanted to, but I couldn't for very long because of what I saw in his eyes. I saw the infinite and indescribable love of God. In total, Ken prayed for me three times. Three times I felt a lovely golden warmth in and around my ears. It was as if my hands were, as if his hands were cast. After the second time, I took off my sound generators. They were similar to hearing aids and a treatment for hypercolossal, hyper, whatever it's called. If I didn't wear them, I'd be in excruciating pain, but God told me to take them off, and so I did, and I placed them in my mom's hands and told her I don't need them anymore. And after the final time Ken prayed, I turned to my mom and I said, it's done. I'm healed. God gave me a miraculous healing. He lifted the burden. He lifted the pain. And so the triumph was complete. Immediately after I was healed, God told me to pray for two other people. My mom says I marched over to them with such authority. And it's really not my personality to do that. But I was overflowing with something I knew I had to pray for them. I no longer wear the sound generators. I'm completely healed. A little bit of pain stuck around for a few days, but I just said to it, no, you have no place here. God has healed me. You are not from God. The pain abated, and now, a week and a half later, it's completely gone. During the illness, I started feeling a call to mission work. I don't know where we would, when I would be well enough to do that, but now I know I can go and do what God has called me to do. The entire time I was ill, I prayed and prayed. I would have a testimony that would touch and encourage even one, just one person. This reminds me of the verse that God gave me more than once. I, uh, sorry, God will give you more than you could ever ask for or imagine. My testimony, my miraculous healing, already been heard by others. And if it helps just one person, that's what's wonderful. The story went around the newspapers in the local area because nobody could, people knew about her. She'd been to six different specialists and they could not help her. But God in his mercy came and touched her and healed her. Six months later, I was on a barge, not a barge, a ferry going from mainland to Vancouver Island to go and minister at another church, and I was just having coffee, and next thing I heard this sound, Ken! And here came the 16-year-old kid running down and threw arms around me. She never lost hope. She never lost hope. 
Don't let the devil steal your hope. Please. Continue to confess the goodness of God. Continue to confess the revelation he's given you. I found in my own life, faith cultivators are obviously the word. Where I look cultivates my faith. When I read about past people and what God did through them, it cultivates my faith. Because then I have hope. If God can use a man like Smith Wigglesworth who couldn't read or write, he can use this uneducated African. Read stories like that. It builds something inside you. You hang on to something, despite the opposition, despite the lies of the enemy. Don't back down. Don't give up. Hold on to your good confession. Let faith arise. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you're faithful and true. I really do. I thank you for all we've seen and experienced. But I thank you for the more that's coming. Thank you. I thank you you never let go of us. Never. Never. I thank you that you are a high priest whom we will continually confess. I thank you for your promises and that through faith and patience we will inherit those promises. We will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Amen.